In this new program of the series looks on public participation, its creators, Antonio Lopez Peláez, Professor of Social Work, and Marta Lora Tamayo Valve, Professor of Administrative Law, both at UNED, will be presenting Urbi et Orbe, written about cities by Jose Tomás Gómez López who is a civil engineer with a very cultivated outlook and he's very sensitive and gets into depth about our cities with a very personal and ironic work with very genuine cultural references. This is a quote of, Lord, of Marta Lora Tamayo, who we will be listening to now. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on when you are listening to the brief podcast we have here today, as has been introduced by Ana Martín, our colleague, José Tomás Gómez is here. How are you? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. How are you? Antonio López Peláez is also here with us. He's a professor of social work. We are both directing many radio programs of this series, Looks on Public Participation, within the framework of the agreement we have with the City Council of Madrid called the Participatory Group. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And uh, hooray for UNED. Today we are going to, and please take notes and go to your library as soon as possible to buy it or uh, order it online. We will be talking about uh, Urbi et Orbi, a book by Jose Tomás Gómez López. I would like to start by congratulating you about the book. For those of you who are not big readers, you can read it in a weekend. It's quite short and it's magnificent. We would like to start by asking you how the idea came up to you. I mean, you're a civil engineer, as Anna was saying, you work in companies. How did you come up with the idea of writing a book? Well, it's about an observation. We are observing cities, but from, from an aware perspective in a way that we can relate or join, attach uh, movements that we can't perceive separately. It's like forming a puzzle. Through an analysis of small pieces, we tried to create an overview, a more global perspective, a more comprehensive perspective. There are many specialized books about cities, about land use planning, economy, sociology. There are many books about urban sociology. But what I wanted to do is to offer a more general uh, perspective. And uh, since it's a uh, program about public participation. I would like to congratulate you for this high quality show that we listen to a lot. This is a way of participating. Writing a book is a way to share my thoughts. If we write uh, thoughts down on the internet, on a blog, they are in the cloud, so to speak. But in this way, the book format requires more attention from readers. I don't think it would take you longer than two hours to read it. In Spanish, we say to give attention, whereas in English, you pay attention. So here it's about getting the attention of readers, and I give this attention back to them with interest. That's the idea behind the book. Well, the book, for those of you who are interested in reading it, it has three main advantages. It takes us closer to cities. Sometimes we are in cities without seeing them, and this book allows us to. Secondly, it allows us to see cities more. And thirdly, it has a lot to do with pedestrian and other controversial topics. I like the quote, uh, if hell is on earth, it's uh, drivers. I love that sentence. In public participation in this program and others as part of this project, we have analyzed uh, that uh, urban policy is social policy and how cities are the space where we interact. An empty city is a dead city. What is your perception if you had to describe Madrid to an alien? If an alien said to you, I loved your book back in Mars where I was reading it, how would you describe cities? Well, it's not about Madrid specifically, it's about cities in general. Of course, I live in Madrid, so my perceptions can be about Madrid, but I'm talking about the concept of city. There's a convergence between cities because of uh, companies and other topics. You can't say each city is completely different. No, we live in a global city. So if we move to another city, another capital, circumstances will be similar. I think we are living a sweet 
moment in in this city many party poopers say the opposite but i would say cities are going through a very sweet moment for instance in madrid we've moved forward a lot to reduce homelessness i remember cities that, that had very dirty rivers years ago we have also diverted traffic outside of the city so let's stay positive we are living a very sweet moment and this allows us to rediscover a public space that is really useful and it's the one creating city so what we have to do is to move forward as citizens with designers i always say that cities come without instruction manuals and they're many people telling you how to play with your city. We have to establish small changes. So this dialogue needs to be developed. There's a chapter called, uh, what does my neighbor think about this? It's about learning lessons from the things we have already built. When there's a new neighborhood being built, normally they use trends that uh, are current in the 80s for instance that was the way when we are building a new neighborhood we take best lessons best practices from what is happening elsewhere in other cities so let's research a bit more about how cities are used how neighbors uh, tackle their problems this is in order to design cities let's learn towards the future using the lessons learned so in this sweet moment that we are living let's make the most seize opportunities to improve life in cities because cities are not a group of buildings i mean they are and it's the first obligation the first duty of a city to provide all citizens with a shelter with a home so when we are able to provide buildings for houses that way we can create a valuable talented diverse space that provides well-being and that is a city before we spoil the content of the book I would like to go back in time something that I loved about the book was the order you wrote it in it's uh, obvious that you're a humanist uh, engineer i wanted to highlight this because you reminded me of alfonso ceda the civil engineer who was the late motive of my thesis and he also loved uh, cities so when you combine the capacity of abstraction that engineers have with that humanistic approach then wonderful works like this book come to surface. For those readers who are hungry to read it, tell us more about the structure of your book, how you created it. I mean, it's not a blog, it's a book, but why did you opt for this kind of structure? Is there a specific order or not? Well, there are 52 chapters in the book, one per week. You can read as a reader one chapter per week, and that liberation is freeing. My pro my objective was not to write more than 300, 400 words on each topic. It's almost like a journalistic article. So it was about removing information, not adding. When we're talking about kiosks, fountains, etc., and other urban elements, you can write a thesis about them, but this is very limiting. I have 300 words to condense all my ideas, all the things that I have never heard. It's about a small contribution of my reflections. And yes, it's kind of like the songs in a CD, which is quite long. I would say it takes you 50 pages, well, two hours to read it. It's like a film or a football match. Like songs in a CD, they vary in nature, but there's a certain unity. When you finish listening to a CD, you understand the global idea behind it. It's like impressionist uh, paintings that have a collection of spots and traces, and uh, it's about taking us back to see the full picture. Same thing happened with these texts I would try to start and finish really well choose my titles really well and the content I'll get to in your next question content is really interesting because a lot of our participation workshops are about uh, fountain a roundabout how people want to define their territories reuse it in the last workshop it was about the connection of two streets it had been reduced 
and transformed. There was a park. They'd slow down the speed of cars. For those of us listening and interested in participation, are there elements of participation that have to do with day-to-day -day encounters? How do you feel about small gathering spaces like squares, gardens, etc.? For instance, I loved the question, I don't know if it's rhetorical, about uh, the planning of Retiro and why it hasn't happened again in other parts of the city, creating a huge park like that. Well, how do you see public participation in cities? Well, in Madrid, there were no parks until the end of the 90s. These were royal spaces. Gardens are actually a novelty. So there's a trend to renaturalize uh, cities before nature was uh, wild, dangerous, but now it's domesticated. We love uh, gardens, landscapes trees, I mean, it's a human thing. From the Arabic culture, we know, we have understood that they lead to the well-being of citizens. So these small elements are very valuable if they are well-structured. And I mean, if we need a big park to run, to meet others, to have fun. Yes, that's important, but we also need smaller spaces that are closer to our homes. There needs to be a structure a more comprehensive structure. Many steps are being taken. We are going in the right path. There's a consensus that it will work and participation that uh, you were asking about. I think that it's important to see success stories. For instance, Retiro Park. Retiro is a huge success story, but it hasn't been replicated elsewhere. Where has it worked in terms of making places pedestrian or not? We understand, we have seen that citizens use public spaces if provided to them, but there's a big competition for these spaces because many people are there to do exercise, to sell things, to, cr to organize concerts, to demonstrate. So there's a sort of battle. On the one hand, you've got the elders, the drivers, the bicycles. We need to fight for public spaces because in the economy of attention that we see on social media, attention is most valuable. If you're in the city, and you want to run a marathon, you don't want to run for kilometers outside of the city. No, you want to run the Castellana Street 40 times so that your friends can take pictures of you. Everybody wants to make the most of these public spaces. Now, another idea I have is that uh, apart from functional spaces like hospitals, libraries, etc., there's also a symbolic part to them. There's a, a storytelling. This is something that we have discovered now in politics, etc. We need to tell a story of our city, of public spaces, and it has to be a shared story so that the citizen experience is much richer. Tomas, I believe that one of the aspects that I enjoyed the most about your book was the subtle irony with which you talk about terms that are part of our vocabulary about cities and the mantras that nobody is contradicting. There are two that I love and that I will be reading. The first one is from the first chapter talking about smart cities and wise cities. I love how brave you are. I mean, you're not assuming any of the big mantras about inclusive cities, smart cities, current cities, but quite the opposite. You use terminology that is quite Castilian, right? You talk about how corny people would say such and such. Anyway, I love it because you're very ironic, but you put things in their place. For instance, in the chapter about uh, why cities, you say the really interesting cities are not smart cities, but wise cities, the one that better define or most appropriately define its uh, purposes. And I love it because I've been in many smart city congresses, where at the end of the day, as you were saying at the end of the chapter, and I want to catch the attention of the future readers of which there will be many, these chapters that are really well structured always end with a reflection as a conclusion, opening the door to keep thinking about a topic, if you've enjoyed it. So I love the end of the chapter about smart cities, where you say, if sensors and mass data are the answer, what was the question to start with? I loved 
that vision. It's ironic, but it's very subtle and at the same time quite real because it's questioning, maybe not questioning, but you're at least wondering, well, what are we even talking about? What are smart cities? It's about wise cities. Now, I also want to mention the renaturalization chapter. I love this fight, especially because it's a politically incorrect construction. It seems that nowadays all environmental and climate change policy is anti-urban and uh, portrays cities as the enemy, whereas historically cities are a place to gather, to meet, and the shelter against a wild nature. So talk to us about how you came up with the different uh, chapters. Talk to us about the mantras that we have all assumed and that we should maybe contradict. Well, I would say that the book has like four layers. The first layer is observation. We need to start by observing in a very aware way. Then there's a second layer that is the historical perspective. And by historical, I don't mean the history of a city, its foundation, but instead think about the last uh, years, the past years, nothing was invented today. We need to have the historical perspective. That's very important to me. The third layer would be about how we connect uh, cities with cultural, artistic references, how it has been perceived by our musicians, writers, etc. And the last layer is a humor, and it doesn't get everywhere. My reflection, intelligence is about reaching goals, and wisdom is about establishing goals. Smart people can do things really effectively, but wise people establish the goals. So it was about, in relation to public participation, as Antonio always says, it's about a reflection that is necessary. Sometimes the wisest people or the most ambitious people are the ones who are successful. So my question was, well, can't we place them inside a context? Like in the comment you were mentioning about nature and cities. Cities were a defense against uh, the sun, against a wild nature, for instance. It shelters you against animals, enemies, the cold. We have domesticated nature in the world, so nature is no longer a threat. So we need to allow it inside our cities. It's like a very warm city with very narrow streets to avoid the sunlight. So that's what I wanted with my book. It's my way to participate providing reflections, uh, providing more perspectives, points of views. How interesting. We are used to having a methodology, an idea, and applying it. But this is a reflective uh, book. So yes, something can be trendy, but what is the cost that a trend has for all of us? What about the expansion models that have been designed? For me, cities have a very lasting footprint. We cannot change buildings, infrastructure for decades. So the social fabric is very important. We don't want people to be isolated in their buildings, but actually interacting. So how do you see the evolution of cities? Do you think we're moving towards a more pedestrian friendly cities? Who do cities belong to? Only the people living there, people who come from other countries, people who are tourists. I came here from Malaga. I'm not even from Madrid. People who come from Colombia might also wonder, am I part of this city? Well, I have a chapter titled like this. Cities belong to all of us. We cannot exclude anyone. People take decisions. People use the city. People own the city. And what we see is a constant battle for public spaces because private spaces, pri private houses, things like that uh, are all about transactions, buying, selling, but public spaces belong to everyone and there's a battle, a fight to see who 
makes the most of it financially, socially, who makes the most of it culturally, physically. So it, as I was saying, it's a fight. And coexistence of citizens needs to be very kind. We are living in a very sweet moment for our cities, even though many party poopers see cities as problems. But the fact that we are living in such a sweet moment for a city leads to the existence of different stakeholders fighting for public spaces. We need to coexist in a very kind manner and it's important too that we create valuable public spaces, not only functional ones to meet needs because a citizen is not a client in a company. It's not a user expecting the city council to provide services. No, they, there's a human and historical perspective dimension. So a valuable space is very important for new parts of the city to be valuable. Population is not growing which means that cities need to reinvent themselves. Sometimes cities are worn off. So for the same model, we need to tweak certain things, tailor cities, readapt them, remodel cities. This will be very important in the upcoming years for cities because often we think about the big ones, but uh, we need a system of cities for a region to work. We can't concentrate everything in one single city. We need a balance between small, medium and large size cities. This is what makes a region or even a country rich. It's not only about the capital city. City. Let's talk about all cities. Capital cities are an exception in the city system. I love how you are getting into all the details in your book. Just to get your appetite to read it, I would like to read another part about the duality between private and public spaces with the two adjectives, exclusive and inclusive. You say when you want to sell the modern and quality of a city, say that it's inclusive because it's easier to work with adjectives than nouns. All ordinances presented by city council have the, the target of making it more resilient, sustainable. But when you are talking about a house, a home, a gym and other retail shops, you talk about them being exclusive. What a delightful paragraph of that tension between inclusive public spaces and exclusive private spaces. I think that you have reflected it really well and I would love for you to share thoughts with us about the cultural and musical baggage that you have and how you start introducing small historical and musical references throughout the book and relating them to to cities. It's about urbanism and humanitarianism. It's building for someone. So I, I'm sorry because I, I actually made the, a reflection myself. I'm so excited about this book. I can't stop myself. Anyway, let me give you the floor now. I love that tension between inclusive, exclusive. I love that you share that about public spaces. I think that this tension is not well resolved. It's a historical conflict that we cannot tackle properly. So since you know a lot about this topic. When do you feel it was best resolved and in what parts of the city can you see that balance being struck between? Yes, that sustainability, so to speak, that has to do with exclusive and inclusive aspects to it. Well, a good city needs to include all citizens, first of all, through housing. I always defend that people should have access to their own housing. That is a basic minimum requirement and one of the biggest challenges for cities in the upcoming years. But cities also need exclusive spaces that collect people with maybe similar hobbies, interests, and it's sometimes not only about being public or private. For instance, opera is a public space. Don't talk to opera aficionados about private uh, operas. They think it's shocking, but football is just as expensive as opera and it's totally private. 
And people talk about it as though it was really inclusive for all social classes. So a good city allows you to move between private and public spaces. Azcona, the amazing script writer, said that the key to a city is what separates public and private spaces, social and individual spaces, that border between being private, being sociable, and this tension is evolving, it's a fact, a segregated city is not interesting. Where there's a really elitistic uh, neighborhood next to another one, rich people get bored. I mean, interesting, rich cities, yes, are safe, but they are unexpected. They are fascinating, ever-changing. The more you mix things up, the more spontaneous it would be. Yes, uh, if you think about Chicago designed to separate neighborhoods between the north and the south, and the banlieues in the north of Paris, the solution at the same time, huge problem generated by their urban plan. I would even dare say that Madrid is a success story because of how immigrants have been incorporated since 1996 when the first waves of immigrants got to Spain. We don't have, I mean, we have problems, but we don't have severe problems like other cities. It's true that you need to find balance in cities, but that tension will always be with us. The tension between public and private will never disappear. We don't want uh, to mislead our listeners to into thinking that this tension will disappear. No, and also, tension is interesting. As you were saying, Marta, culturally, I once was taking a walk in the Letras neighborhood and I entered Lope de Vega's house and I loved a quote at the entry that said that the own shelter is a lot, even if it's little, and uh, a lot of shelters are little if they are others. Virginia Woolf also talked about a room of one zone. I think that cities need people to find their own spaces. This is fundamental. And this space of one zone, as much as possible, needs to be high quality, because in many Spanish cities in the 60s and 70s, I mean many, buildings were constructed but we need these spaces to be rich and public spaces to be valuable with regards to what marta was saying there's an article about bars i think these are fundamental spaces for cities i would like to remind you of gabinete caligari that said uh, bars what Amazing Spaces, that's the title of the article. And then I finish with uh, Bruegel, an artistic reference to their fun uh, pubs and Hopper, a fantastic American painter would portray a very lonely, sad bars. At the end of the day, artists have always reflected cities in their work, as well as filmmakers. All urban mobility matters can be seen in many films like Metropolis. Let's make the most of the artistic perspective and incorporate it in public discussions and let's make our citizens' experience richer. Thank you so much, Tomas. Uh, how interesting. I love this program. This was an initiative by Tomas and Marta, by the way, because for those of you listening to us, we have many interventions and workshops in this series, but that literary creative perspective, observing the tensions of a city, this is fascinating. Thank you, Tomas. Thank you, Marta. Just to finish, with a smile like we do normally at UNIT, I want to invite you to a reflection. The author says this about cities, but it could have to do with uh, every person, even the technicians in the radio. It, the sentence is, a sensual city is not the same thing as a city with sensors. Thank you very much for finishing the podcast with this touch of humor. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you, Tomas.